session about rise of motion control robotic arms. It's basically going to be a session about introducing you to how Python is using being, being used in the world of mechatronics, and in this case, in robotics. So in particular, I'm going to be showing how we are able to use a library called Leap Motion uh, in order to be able to control some robotic arms, which is you can see at the desk. So I do hope to make this a more practical session. So yeah, without further ado, uh, we'll just get started. So the main inspiration for <laughs> this uh, particular project was actually from a Pacific Rim, actually. So I'm guessing all of you have heard of a Pacific Rim. So basically, I always had the fascination of the idea of being able to control like a robot basically with motion control directly and being able to just move directly like those in Pacific Rim, being able to move your hands freely and being able to just walk, like basically be controlled by, by inside by actually like simulating the walking itself. So eventually with motion controlled robotic cars such as this, this may be actually a possible thing that can happen in the future. So. It's really great to see that how technology has progressed this far, especially now that we have access to some libraries like Leap Motion and also, of course, the robotic arms themselves and how we're able to use the open source community, uh, community to share our findings and eventually also come one step closer to getting the community closer to achieving something like this maybe in the future. And because oftentimes we are often surprised by how far technology has taken us, we always underestimate uh, things by seeing sci-fi movies and always thinking that they're just a product of fiction, but they may actually be a new thing in the future that we have not yet considered. So why Python and mechatronics? Uh, it's a it's a lesser known field. I mean, most of the talks here are generally about neurolinguistic programming, NLP, or about other stuff as well, such as machine learning, but not a lot of people talk about the mechatronic side of Python and its applications within the robotic sense. And you may be asking, why Python and mechatronics? I'm sure that if you're attending a session, you probably already know a bit about robotics or, yeah, uh, keen about exploring it, so you may already have some background knowledge. So it's already very well documented. So, and it's already very, uh, in, in, the website, in the websites, it's already very, uh, a lot of people have already done developments in robotics. And eventually, it's also very minimalistic, and it supports many finite, element analysis in software such as Abacus, if you've already used it before as well. And of course, there's also ROS. So today I'm going to be demonstrating a use case of Leap Motion, which is in a, a, from a library and uh, Leap Motion provides itself. And, but there is another uh, well-known library as well called ROS. So basically, this library is really kind of also another basic in that robotics development library and essentially you're able to be, begin developments and in it and essentially Python can be used in it and that's also a great thing so over there in the right you can see ROS in action basically that's just a example of like some stuff that of some very beginner stuff like write a simple publisher and subscriber but I'm not going to cover that but that's another potential field as well of robotics and Essentially, that's also another use case of library that it can be applied to. So, more to the hardware stuff now. So, firstly, as part of this setup you can see over here, there's the leap motion sensor, which you can see over here as well. So, if you don't know what leap motion sensor is before, it's basically a sensor that you can use to basically track your movements. And it tracks, it does so in a very accurate way. So. Basically, it's able to it's able to record every single bone in your in your hand. So basically, if you're if you know like a bit of biology, it's usually like you're tracking like metacarpal and your proximal bone. So it tracks all of that basically, and it tracks all your the finger all the bones in the fingers. And basically, it does it takes the measurements from there. So eventually. From there, we're able to convert the coordinates to will, which will be used to move the robot. And of course, the robotic arms themselves. In this particular sense, because I'm combining a robotic arm with a hand as well, it's uh, eight degrees of freedom, and it has uh, also a servo of five fingers claw. And this is the actual name of the product that I bought on uh, Alibaba. It just shows that how easy it is to uh, get one of these 
you can get one of these straight up like Alibaba or some other uh, uh, e-commerce site as well and it gets to delivered very easily and so it's very easy to start your own project, which is why I am here today talking about this, because I do believe that it's important for uh, everyone to get started in developing their own robotics projects, uh, because it's very easy just get a robotic arm and uh, of Alibaba, and it usually costs like 100 to 150 dollars tops for like a pair of robotic arms. Yeah, so it's pretty good and it's pretty like uh, cost efficient for starting such a cool project, I'd say. And of course, we're using the I'm using the ESP32 as the control module for this particular robot. So uh, some of you may have already known about Raspberry Pi as a potential uh, microcontroller as well. But this is another type of microcontroller that it's also used in particular to control this robot. So uh, ESP32 is basically a microcontroller that also contains a Wi-Fi module, as you can see over here. And essentially, I'm using two of these, one on each arm. Uh, these are they, these are located like uh, on the arms around here as you can see I keep them enclosed in the white boxes so basically it helps to coordinate the movements of the robots essentially we're sending the program based on a Python code to con uh, convert to the Arduino code which is then sent over here which I'll talk about in the next few slides and eventually this module will send the commands which is already uploaded from the Arduino code and eventually this will be able to control the robots and of course in this particular sense we're making use of asynchronous programming because as you can see there are two different robotic arms for each of these two robotic arms we have to create a program for each so essentially uh, we're relying on a kind of an asynchronous programming concept to be able to do it this way we're running two parallel programs at the same time and so this requires different functionality for each one although it's similar coding so essentially we're just reusing the same code but we're running it at the same time so of course they, they have a little functionality so and afterwards of course in the connection of the module there's uh, three main parts of this basically the connection request which we send from the computer to the Arduino essentially we send in a request and eventually in the program itself which I will also detail later there is also already kind of a web socket which we use to send a connection request so essentially we're using a local kind of a connection basically to be able to uh, do the connection from the laptop to the Wi-Fi uh, to the ESP32 which will move the robot and we do use, yeah, we do utilize the ESP2 as the control module and eventually, as I said before as well, we co convert the coordinates from sensors to the controls. So that's how we, in the end, we move the robot. But essentially, this is the very simplistic way of uh, how we connect to the module. And I'll explain more about the connection process in the next few slides. So this is the connection architecture that we use. and. This is, I've already talked about this briefly as well, but this is a more detailed overlook of it. So it starts off from the leap motion control, and of course we have the leap motion controller, which will, will be run alongside the Python script. And from here, we then move on to the mediator Python code, which of course has an external memory as well, which stores uh, based on uh, the ESP32. And eventually, we then, of course, from there we transport data to the ESP32 <coughs> microcontrollers, which is then run by a C++ script. But essentially, for today, we're going to be covering this side of the architecture. So yeah, we're not going to be looking so much into this side, but we're going to be looking more on the Python side. And of course, afterwards, after it's uh, transported to the uh, microcontrollers, it'll then be able to be controlled directly from the robotic arm, which brings us to this physical environment. So essentially, we're just converting all the coordinates the point of bone structure that it can detect from our ha movement of our hands from the sensors to eventually bringing it over to the physical environment where it'll be brought and you can directly put a practical application on it. And this is essentially the file structure of the whole robot. So you can see we have two of the ESP32s, one for the left hand, one for the right hand. And same for the Python side as well, which does as I described before. So 
We do have like one, as I said before, we do run one parallel program for each and I'll demonstrate this when I go into the demo side of all this. So it'll make much more sense when I start going to the demo side because we want to run two parallel programs at the same time. And of course, in robotics projects, one of the biggest uh, problems is also about scalability. So, of course, it's about in regards to having multiple arms being controlled at the same time. So two arms are being controlled at the same time. And we often have to add in like new features and such. And we also have to, of course, because building this robot, because you have to continue adding features. For example, like before I got the robotic hand, for example, when it was just the arm, I had to program the arm, but eventually I had to also uh, quickly scale the code to eventually con uh, connect with the hand as well, because essentially we need to also like move the fingers while we also move the arm as the kind of degree of freedom, right? So that's the main kind of like challenge as well with scalability, because when we add new components each time to the hands, we need to keep keeping our code clean and easy to be added on because well, especially since we're having two at the same time, and also keep in mind reusability because essentially these are identical codes as mentioned before, but because they are different robotic arms, we still need to contain them in different code codings. So, of course, add it as we have more, for example, when we have the arm, we have three degrees, but when we had the hand, we just added some more degrees of freedom, so that happens as well, and of course, how we are able to make further developments into making the whole process smarter, how to automate it better, how to really help other people to also like reuse the code as well better that way, and eventually also just adding on stuff into the project. And this is this official skeletal tracking system diagram from the leak motion itself. So as you can see, there are these are all the bones that are being tracked by leap motion technology. So from the distal, I know this is not a biology subject, but <laughs> might as well just go into it a bit since this is part of the whole tracking system. And of course, this, we have the distal, we have the intermediate phalanges, yeah, uh, proximal phalanges, metacarpals. So of course, eventually, this all is being tracked and uh, we will eventually come up with the whole length of the finger to be able to track each bone accurately. So basically, there are some formats which I'll talk about as well, which uh, help me to uh, take a measurement from the tip of the finger to the other tip, the other end of the finger, in order to be able to conduct the movements. But this is how leap motion technology is able to capture most of the movement very fluidly, because each of the bones are already put into, each of the bones are already being tracked, and each of the, from the tip to the uh, basically from each bone, they're all each keeping track of the coordinates. And that's how the technology is able to really track the movements well and how eventually, like when I demonstrate over here, like how it will be able to record the, each movement of the finger very fluidly. So essentially that's how it does it. And of course, there's also the testing suits. So uh, throughout the project, I always launched a few testing suits. This is just one of the uh, examples. So, of course, one of the things was just like, yeah, printing like the coordinates sent by a string hand. So, how many degrees, for example, was uh, generated by the servo? And how many, yeah, in general, how many degrees the hand would, it was able to rotate? And yeah, based on the degrees of freedom, it was possible to take as well. But basically, printing out the coordinates, printing out the length, it helps to also like streamline the whole development process and you're able to keep track of the each movement of the bones very fluidly as well, and that's how you're able to really automate the process better. Now I'm gonna be jumping into the code a bit, and it's gonna it's gonna get a bit long, so I hope you bear with me, because don't worry, at the end we'll have a very interactive session of moving the robotic arms, and I'll call one or two volunteers to come up here. So do stay back for that, it's gonna be a fun time. Okay, back to the code. <laughs> so, basically, Firstly, we go with defining and initializing. So, of course, we import a few libraries. As you can see, we have the leap library over here. And eventually, we yeah, the some of the normal libraries. So we also import, uh, the, the main ones to highlight are really leap and WebSocket. 
And when we're using WebSocket as the connection request that we're sending to the ESP. So basically, that's one of the, that's the main connection pro protocol that we're using. And of course, we're importing methods as well because we're going to calculate some distance as well from one tip of the finger to another, as I mentioned before, to show how the automation process works. And of course, these are just some. Uh, we we then declare like the finger names as well because well. We want to keep track of which finger is which, and this is how eventually in the code we are able to keep track and eventually really come up with like the main conditional uh, tracking system. Like if this finger is part of thumb, then it'll do this formula and such, which I will explain later as well. And of course, some of the bone names as well, so we are able to keep track at one which bone it's currently at. And Basically, this class is made in order to be as a listener. So it's, uh, it really, what it does, it's very self-explanatory, really. It just simply gets the coordinates and access the listener, basically. So very self-explanatory. And of course, just some definitions, yeah, about initializing, connect, uh, being able to disconnect, um, exiting as well, and of course, uh, the main part I want to highlight here is really the function of defining on on frame because on uh, frames are a critical part of uh, the leap motion architecture. So basically, the frame function is able uh, is part of the uh, leap motion library in order to keep track of the leap motion movement. So each movement from leap motion is basically a kind of a frame as well. Uh, it's, it's called a frame. So basically, the more you move it as well, it's basically part of the frame, and Eventually, we do use a we do you put it into the controller and execute the function, and eventually that's how we keep track of the frames, essentially the movements that each robot makes per frame. And this is about converting coordinates in hand. Eventually, we do do a for loop, and eventually we do select which hand we are on. So, basically. This is how we determine whether which hand is on, whether it's the left hand or whether it's the right hand. And eventually, we just have some stuff as well, so just like de determining the direction of the hand. And direction is also like something we declare in order to keep track of, well, the movement of the robot as well. And of course, uh, we, di we defer the function of each hand, so of course, Printing out the hand, uh, printing out some coordinates as well from the direction, the normal, and basically keeping track of the pitch, the roll, and the yaw. Uh, essentially, these coordinates will help us to be able to control the hand, and also that's how we determine the movement of the hand. And a bit of a longer piece of code. So we do have, we firstly have like a string, string hand fingers, and eventually from there we. Declare, we declare basically after that and being able to keep track of the fingers and that goes into being able to determine which finger type it is as you can see over here and eventually we also then get into the more complex formulas as well so basically we loop over all the fingers and essentially as you can see it's a it's a for loop over all the fingers and eventually we also behave differently on different bones. So as you can see, I have a different function for the metacarpal. So essentially, what I'm doing is I'm keeping track of all the coordinates that's being recorded from the bone, as you can see, from one tip to the other tip. So as you can see over here, it's yeah the x, y, and z coordinates of one end to another. And eventually putting it into a distance form that's calculate the distance from that one end of the tip to the other end of the tip. And as you can see, I repeated it as well on the other parts as well, collecting it basically from the proximal and the distal as well, as you can see over here. And this is how we eventually calculate the distance. And after we calculate all of this, we just uh, put them all in the total. And that's how we eventually calculate everything, as you can see over here. Um, eventually, we're able to use that to get the length of the whole bone and eventually also and the figure in general and eventually that's how we managed to get all the coordinates and import it into the system to be able to move the hand fluidly. And afterwards we just simply calculated degrees as well so that we were able to control of how 
how we want the servo to move, basically, and basically giving out the commands on the degrees of freedom that the servo has. And as you can see, my formula here is just like the, the F over total over 180. And eventually, we also declare something for the string hand fingers as well in order to print out the current measurements as well. And this is also an integral part of the application. We have to connect through WebSocket, as I mentioned before. So we have the string hand, and eventually we do. Com we we need to be able to combine this with the current current coordinates of the string hand fingers and the string hand palm, and we eventually print that out to show the current status of everything. Because this is also going to be imported into the C++ module, the ESP32. So this is how it's imported. We get the coordinates, then we send them through. And this is the authentication, basically it's the authentication process. This is the request that we're sending. We're using the WebSocket uh, module, the library. So we're able to uh, connect to the IP. And this IP is basically, this IP always changes based on, well, the connection. So at this time, like uh, I always have to declare it manually. So I always, basically every time the ESP ch uh, changes its uh, um, IP address, I put it directly here manually. So that's how I'm able to send a connection request. And of course, we send a request, and and afterwards we just close the WebSocket. And this is the main component, which is also the final part of the programming slide. So. We import, as you can see, we import sleep from time. This is just to, in order to create delayed movements in case the robotic arm sometimes requires some delays because one drawback from a robotic arm is sometimes that too much movement, too, uh, too accurate without any delays can cause uh, significant like delays on its own itself because it cannot handle such frequent movement from time to time. So it's important to be able to de delay, put the delays uh, very, uh, very uh, plan delays very well because oftentimes, like, uh, it doesn't handle movement very quickly. So, also, we use the controller and we finally, yeah, declared, uh, put in the listener as well to send a whole request. And eventually, we also, yeah, add the listener as part of what we did before. And finally, this is just a kind of a uh, an overall kind of also part of the trial series as well. So basically, we're using this to, in order to be able to just track the whole keyboard if we press something. So basically, this is just to in order to quit the program if we need to at the middle. So of course, when you press Q, it just quits. So it's nothing really important at this moment. So eventually, we remove the listener as well again. And that's the programming part. So that's essentially how we made the whole Python N of the whole robot. And of course, future project areas can include different stuff. And yeah, one of the things I'm looking into at the moment is also making it cloud-based. I'm currently already uh, utilizing services such as PubNub or also using uh, AWS to track the coordinates and also possibly send it through there. So it can also help with uh, tracking analytics of like uh, more na more suitable analytics for how the robot works and eventually function as well. And of course, utilize more uh, microservices as part of the whole cloud-based systems. And uh, create more operation metrics, that's also a possible field area. And yeah, who knows, potentially one day this may be a thing. It's, it's always possible. Having motion-controlled robotic arms is one part of it. All we need now is just, yeah, uh, whole big robot and just legs that you can, can move movement from the legs as well to motion control the whole leg part of it as well. But I'm pretty sure it's possible sometimes in the future. And for some further trips and tricks in Python for mechatronics, uh, of course, uh, yeah, streamline processes because of course, as I've described before, scaling is a big issue often in these kinds of projects because we often start with the arm first, as I mentioned, then the hand. So we always need to make room for scaling in these kinds of scenarios. And of course, play around with different technology. Um, oftentimes, it doesn't always, one type of technology doesn't always work. Every type of technology has its drawbacks. This one isn't perfect as well. Sometimes, I mean, it has its drawbacks as well in terms of sensitivity and such. 
but of course, that's why it's all important to play around with the sensor that you work. Leak motion is then the only possible type of motion sensor, but this time I'm, I'm using currently for my project. So it's definitely good to play around with a lot of different libraries, see what they can do. Even for example, this, because I'm using leak motion for this one, I'm describing leak motion, but ROS, as I mentioned before, is another possible robotic area as well. So definitely it's very good to play around with all that. And of course, as I said, utilize analytics. Potentially, this could also uh, be streamlined to the cloud as well for uh, for your developments, and that's essentially how we're able to also better make their uh, our research in the robotics as well. Essentially, contribute to the community as well in terms of uh, putting forward analytics and such. And yeah, these are the main possible research areas that you can go forward on. Okay, it's demo time. So. <laughs> Um, can I have two volunteers who would like to try out the robotic arm? All right, one, two. Yep, so I will just put, I will just trigger the program first. And hopefully this works out right. All right, would you like to try? Yep. <coughs> Yep. And you can also put your other hand at the same time as well. Yep. yep. So try gripping your fingers. Uh, yeah. As, so as you can see, the, they are based on the leap motion tracking system. It's tracking the fingers very accurately, as you can see. So every single movement they're, they're make, uh, that is being made is tracked very carefully. You better not in this context. <laughs> okay. Cool, Alright. Who was the next one who wanted to try? You wanted to try? Yeah. Please go ahead. Oh, cool. Yes, sir. Ah, not anymore? <laughs> Didn't no, play with those anymore? I avoided dealing with it. It's been two years, I believe. Oh, okay. Everything's cool, cool, cool. Cool, cool. Yeah, so due to time constraints, you only apply, uh, get two people to try it out for now. And yeah, but that's it for me. Uh, so as you can see over here, as uh, tried by some of the, oh yeah, I have to terminate the program first in case. <laughs> any of the unnecessary guesters. So yeah, that's it from the robotics side as well. So as you can see, there are some drawbacks in terms of sensitivity, but uh, I tried to, at some points, I tried to like uh, put some delays in order to also control the flow of the motion of the robotic arm in, in order to not put too many unnecessary gestures that can kind of like upset it in a way I sense. Because when, it kind of like, uh, when it gets to too much motion over time, it just suddenly just stops directly. So that's not what we want as well. So I have to put some delays in order as part of that. So I think we still have time for uh, questions. So at the moment, are there any questions? Yes. Uh, how much is the average cost? Oh, it's so. Uh,